we're going to be okay so here we are again everybody welcome back to another focus on prophecy bible study tonight we are in revelation chapter 13 and we're going to be looking at this idea of the mark of the beast versus the seal of god and so i just want to say welcome i uh, glad you're here tonight um i've got uh uh, we're, we're kind of, it's the summertime and things get a little slower in the summer. And so, um, you know, for those with us on Zoom, thank you so very much. And also for those who are watching on Facebook Live, and of course, later on in the week, we have people who are watching on YouTube. Now, folks, I'm hoping that you get settled in. Uh, you got everything in place that you need. Get your Bibles out. Again, we're in Revelation chapter 13. And this promises to be a wonderful study tonight. Again, kind of looking at what it means to have the name of God on our foreheads and the seal of God as compared to the name of the beast and the mark of the beast. And we're going to be contrasting those tonight. Now, last week, we were looking at what Revelation 13 refers to as the beast with lamb-like horns. And remember, it's not a lamb-like beast, but a beast with lamb-like horns. And we discovered last week that this was actually the United States of America, and we're going to give it a little bit more uh, description in our review here tonight. And so tonight, what we're going to be diving into, again, is the mark of the beast. Who is the beast? What is its mark? Uh, what does it stand for? And of course, the issues surrounding God's people. So again, welcome. I'm so glad you're here joining us tonight. Um, again, for those of you on Facebook Live, please feel free to jump in, add your comments. For those of you who are with us on Zoom, again, anytime you want, jump in, uh, give us your comments. Uh, love to have you here. I love that you are here and you're a part of this study. Folks, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer before we dive into Revelation 13 again. Let's pray. Well, Father God in heaven, we are so thankful that you are our God and that you don't do anything without letting us know through your prophets and Bible uh, prophets and prophecy. And Lord, just thank you for making us aware of what is going to be happening in the world and just before the second coming of Jesus. And we pray tonight, Holy Spirit, as always, you would be poured out, be our teacher, be our guide, open the word to us and help us to understand what we are about to study here tonight. In Jesus' holy and precious name we pray, amen. So again, welcome, so happy to have you here. Now folks, again, get your Bibles out or your Bible app, we're going to Revelation chapter 13. Now, as you're doing that, uh, one of our key thoughts for the evening is that the book of Revelation, again, highlights the conflict between good and evil down through the ages. And it was a war we saw that started in heaven, that war came to earth. And now, folks, we are caught up in what is known as the great controversy, this war between Christ and Satan. And uh, last week, we, okay, last okay, week last we week talked, week about, talked about, okay, I'm getting some uh, feedback here. Here we go. Uh, just kind of little tech stuff. So last week we talked about um, the book of Revelation, and we discovered that there are in Revelation 13, three forces that come together, and they are religion, politics, and money. And now, again, you might be wondering why these three, um, uh, because, and, you know, why is Revelation focusing on them? And it's because when these three forces come together, um, they are going to create a power dynamic, a religious power dynamic, um, and, and it's going to be actually demonic. And according to the Bible, when these three forces come together, they're going to set in motion a chain of events that is going to usher in the end of the world as we know it and the second coming of Jesus Christ, which is what you know we're all looking forward to. Now, as we dive into Revelation 13, we see a religious system um, that uses politics. And we see that in verses 1 through 10. And it's going to use the power of this religious 
system is going to use the power of the state and the courts um, to impose its will on others. And then we see a political system that is going to use religion um, and its false ideas about God uh, and God's will in order to justify its own control over people. And then in the end, both of those powers are going to come together. The religious power and the political power are going to come together, and they're going to manipulate the economy to control others. Because let's face it, if they can control what you can buy and you can sell, and we might know a little something about that. If they can control how you buy and sell, they can control basically every other aspect of your life. And so again, religion and politics are going to come together. They're going to create this power dynamic. It's going to be demonic, and they're going to manipulate the economy in, a, in an attempt to control how and when people worship. And when they do, when this comes together, they are going to usher in the end of the world and end time events and leading up to the second coming of Jesus. And again, it's all a part of the great controversy. Now, just as again, as a quick review, last week, we saw a beast that would be a religious power that would combine religion and politics to rule the world. Folks, who are we talking about? You can take your um, microphone, you can unmute yourself. Who are we talking about here tonight? Who is this beast power? It's a religious power. It's also a political power, and it ruled the Christian world. Who are we talking about here tonight? The Catholic Church. Yeah, the Catholic Church, Papal Rome. This is exactly who we're talking about. Right, this beast is apostate Christian, the apostate Christian church known as Papal Rome. Um, it became corrupted when, again, as a review, Emperor Justinian uh, in 538 AD turned the power of his throne over to the church. Uh, he gave civil power to Papal Rome, and when he did um, this in 538 AD, Papal Rome. Um, became both a religious and civil power. And it used this power, this power corrupted the church, and it used this power to control how and when people worshiped. And folks, tonight you're going to see this issue of controlling how and when people worship is critical to understanding the mark of the beast. And how and when we worship is also critical to understanding who God's people are because both are in contrast to each other. And then last week, folks, we also saw another beast. Um, you might remember this one. Um, it's a new beast. It's a new nation. Um, it um, had lamb-like horns, and it came up in a part of the world that was sparsely populated, and it would come into existence sometime close to um, the fall of papal Rome, its loss of power, sometime around 1798. Um, folks, what power are we talking about? What nation are we talking about um, that represents this beast with lamb-like horns? America. America, yes, it's the United States of America. And we saw last week how closely um, you know, the United States actually fit this description. Now, here's why it's important to know who the beast is, Papal Rome, and this beast with lamb-like horns. Because, again, um, history is going to repeat itself. And once again, Papal Rome is going to come into power, and it is going to use that power um, given to it by this beast with lamb-like horns to once again tell people and force people when and how they can worship. And so, yes, Debbie, welcome. Good to see you on Facebook. Yes, it is the United States of America. So, folks, uh, again, a little quiz there, and we're doing great with that. Now, here's why this is also critically important before we get into dive into the rest of our study. According to Revelation 13, 16, and 17, um, I'm sorry, that, that, that says three, but it's actually 13. Um, 16 to 17, it causes all 
to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads um, so that people cannot buy or sell unless they have this mark uh, or the name of the beast or the number of his name. And so tonight, this brings us to the issue of uh, what is the mark of the beast? And here's what you need to know. Every person on the planet will soon receive a mark. Those who worship and obey the beast will receive the mark of the beast. Those who worship and obey the creator God, our creator God, will receive the mark or seal of God. And both marks are placed at the same time. And both marks are symbolic. And they represent authority and allegiance, approval and ownership. In other words, the mark or the seal is going to tell the world who it is that you worship, who your God is. So, folks, let me ask you tonight. Just talking about the mark of the beast, there's all sorts of ideas and thoughts out there and theories about what the mark of the beast is. So let me ask you, is it a laser tattoo, an invisible laser tattoo that can only be seen under a certain light? No. Is it a microchip under the skin? No. Uh, how about no. a new currency that's going to take over the world? Maybe it's going to be a new euro or something. Um, nope. How about the barcode? I often see the barcode with 666 on it. Um, or how about a red star tattooed on the forehead? <laughs> I have heard all of these um, as theories as to what is the mark of the beast. And folks, we just went through COVID. And of course, there were issues around buying and selling. And people were asking was this whole COVID thing and some of the mandates the actual mark of the beast? And we're going to see tonight, it's not tattoos or barcodes or microchips or vaccine shots. It's none of that. Um, so what we need to know is that in order to identify the mark of the beast, uh, we need to understand that the mark of the beast is, and at first, in order to do that, it first helps to identify and understand the seal of God. When you understand what the seal of God is and, and God's name written on our forehead, then and only then can we understand the mark of the beast because the mark of the beast is the opposite of having God's name written on your forehead and what the seal of God is. And so to understand the mark, we need to understand the other. So, folks, with that in mind, I want to kind of bring up Revelation chapter 14 and 1. And could somebody please read for us this passage, Revelation 14, 1. Could somebody read that from the screen for us, please? And I looked, and lo, a lamp stood on the Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 having his father's name written in their foreheads. Okay, so here we have a group of people. The Bible calls them uh, the 144,000. And, and they have God's name. Now, now look at this. This is a specific detail. What identifies as unique to these 144,000 is that God's name, their father's name is written on their forehead. What is so significant about the idea of a name? Why, what, what did names represent um, for the Hebrews, for God's people? What did names represent in the Bible? A belonging. A belonging. Okay. Being a lineage. Part of the family. Uh, okay. Um, Jay, what was that again? Sorry, it was a lineage. A lineage. Okay. Um, absolutely. So it told people who your family is. I'm Bob Windsor. My wife is B Windsor and identifies us, my kids, their lineage. Yeah, names certainly did that. Um, but there's something else that names signified um, in scripture. Sometimes to do with the person's purpose, like what they are meant to accomplish in life. Okay, a person's purpose or what they were to accomplish in life. I'd like that. Uh, also, what we know is that a person's name also represented some characteristic about that person. Sometimes it represented your character. Um, sometimes it represented a characteristic or something about your nature. 
For example, the name Jacob meant deceiver. Yes, Eunice, it represented um, uh, character. And yes, Debbie, also belonging. So there is that aspect. And so when you have God's name written on your forehead, it does indicate your lineage, the family you belong to. I belong to God's family um, because I have his name. But also, the name represents a characteristic, um, a purpose, or a plan um, that was intended for your life. And so here's what you need to know. Oh, and again, um, just kind of clicked off here. Your name described either your character, your personality, or it described a personal attribute or quality of that person. Now, folks, um, here's what you need to know. You will not receive the seal of God if you do not have the name of God. Um, now, here's what we know, that back in the day, ancient seals were used often by kings to signify authority and approval. So if you had the king's uh, seal, personal seal, his seal gave you authority to act on his behalf. Now, we know that even today, a personal signature of your name gives authority, uh, maybe on a check uh, regarding money. Uh, it might give us, us authority to a legal document. And here we find that God is writing his name on the saved the 144,000 or his end time people as his personal authority and guarantee of protection and everlasting life. And so God's name and his seal kind of go together. Now, if a name represents some personal attribute or a person's character or personality trait, why do we know about God's character? Right? Because the name of God represents his character. And those who receive the seal of God will have the gracious character of Jesus dim, deeply planted on, in their minds. It's going to be a part of who they are. So tell me, folks, what do you know about the character of God? What do you know about his personality and his attributes? What do you know about God? What do you know to be true about him and his name? Loving, caring, forgiving. Loving, caring, forgiving. Gracious. Okay. Righteous. Righteous, yes. What else do we know about God? And of course, those of you on Facebook, again, please feel free to contribute. We're, I'm watching the chat over there as well. Folks, when we get into the Bible, the Bible says this one thing about God. I'm going to ask somebody if you'd be willing to read um, it's 1 John 4 and 8 for us. I'm going to put it up on the screen. Can somebody read this for us, please? Anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Okay, what is God? What does the Bible say he is? Love. Love. Now, folks, understand, it's not that he chooses to love or, or that he just acts lovingly. This is actually who he is, he is. This is his nature. He is love. You cannot separate love from God any more um, than you, you can um, you know, separate him from the rest of the Trinity. God actually is love. This is the fundamental characteristic of who he is. Could somebody read this next verse for us, please? John 13, 35. God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God in them. Okay, and then we have this. It's John 13, 35. Could somebody read that, please? All people will know you are my disciples if you love one another. Okay, so here's the key thought, and this is where we're going with this tonight. Love is the basis of a relationship with God. All worship, all obedience and service must be freely given without force or coercion. God will never force you to love and obey him. This is fundamental to God's character. And yes, Eunice, God is perfect. 
And I would argue that he is perfect in love. This is his character. And so God's name should represent in our minds when somebody asks you who is God or, or what does God mean and represent, our response should be God's name is love. God is love. This is the characteristic of his name. In the Bible, again, when Jacob was given a name, he was given the name deceiver. Um, Satan means accuser. Um, Benjamin means child of joy or happiness. And God means love. And so if you have God's name written on your forehead, then this means or it represents God's character of love reproduced in our lives. This is what God's end time people will have. They'll have God's name um, written on their foreheads, meaning that his love is now reproduced in their lives. Love becomes a part of our nature and our character. Um, and it results in a freely chosen relationship with Jesus. Um, uh, and, and so if, if this character of love in this relationship of love is freely chosen, and it's a relationship you freely choose, then the mark of the beast, whatever it is, has to be opposite of freely loving um, intimate relationships. It has to be the opposite of that. Now, so what is the mark of the beast? And this is the question of the evening. What is the mark of the beast? Now, if the seal of God and God's name is love reproduced in our life, where we have an intimate, loving, obedient relationship with God, then what is the mark of the beast? So could somebody read for us Revelation 13 and 7? I'm going to, again, I'm going to put it up on the screen for you. What is Revelation 13 and 7? That no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Okay. That still doesn't answer the question, right? But it tells us that, um, that whatever this mark of the beast is, if you don't receive it um, willingly, it is going to be forced on you. And what they're going to do is control the economy so that you cannot buy or sell unless you do exactly what they tell you to do. Now, does God use force or coercion uh, to manipulate us into having a relationship with him or obeying him? No. Okay, and uh, what, why not? Why does God not use force to get the whole world to obey him? Folks, any, any, anybody? Why does God not use force? Because he's love, and a loving God would not force things on you right absolutely absolutely so if god is love the moment you bring force or coercion into a relationship the relationship is no longer a loving intimate relationship god is love the moment the moment if god were to use force in that moment he would cease to be a loving god god can no more force you to love him um then, then Satan can actually, uh, uh, you know, uh, be righteous. God cannot use force. And so, Debbie, yes, we come down to free will. And, and so God has given us the free will, the ability to love him or leave him. And that is a choice. And God does not manipulate or coerce that choice um, in the same way that the mark of the beast is going to force us to disobey God. And yes, Eunice, I'm with you. The mark of the beast in some way, shape, or form is disobedience to God. Because God tells us, if you love me, look, you're going to obey me, right? And, and so if we have a love for God that's honest and genuine and out of our own free will, we obey God, which he gives us, yes, Debbie, the freedom to do, um, then the mark of the beast has to remove that freedom from us. And so you'll know that you're receiving the mark when you are a part of a system that forces people to re behave religiously in a way that it dictates. 
So key to understanding the mark of the beast is love versus coercion. So anytime you have a system that uses force, it is not of God. God will not force you to love him, serve him, or obey him. Because the moment it's forced, it isn't love, it isn't actual service, and it's not obedience. When you use force, it is compliance. And so, folks, do we see systems in the world today that force people to comply with its rules? We've kind of lived under that, haven't we? So we know a little bit right now about what it means to not be able to buy or sell if you don't do what the powers tell you to do. And that's about as much as I'm going to say about that. So again, where does this mark come from? Now, we have said, uh, you know, this term mark of the beast, where does it come from? Because we've been saying all along that 70% of the book of Revelation is made up of quotes and references used in the Old Testament. This means if you want to understand what the mark of the beast is, uh, and, and, and you need to go back to the Old Testament, right? You need to understand Revelation. Uh, you want to understand it, go back to the Old Testament. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, okay, I don't recall reading about a mark of the beast in the Old Testament. I have never seen that there. No, you haven't. You haven't seen that phrase in the Old Testament. But what you have seen in the Old Testament, and as soon as you read it, you're going to go, oh, is the idea that how and when you worship is like a sign, a mark, or a seal that tells the world who your God is. And what you need to know is a Revelation chapter 13 is actually using a reference that God uses in Exodus chapter 13. And if you go back to Exodus like 12 and 13, God is laying out for the children of Israel the Passover. And he tells them when it comes to the Passover, uh, Passover he is telling them how and when to keep the Passover. And he gives very clear instruction on how and when to keep the Passover. Now, look at what God says about um, what it means when you obey him when it comes to the Passover um, and, and how the Jews kept it and when they kept it. Uh, could somebody read this for us? It comes from, um, it's Exodus 13 and 9. And again, look at what God says. Focus on this. What he says about how and when the children of Israel kept the Passover. Look at what he says. Could somebody read for us Exodus 13 and 9? I'll put it up on the screen here. And it shall serve as a sign to you on your hand and as a reminder on your forehead that the law of the Lord may be in your mouth. For with a powerful hand, the Lord brought you out of Egypt. Okay. Folks, um, do you see the language being used here? Do you see this language in Revelation chapter 13? Or am I alone in this? Um, okay. Um, I, I see a hand up. Boriana? Yeah, to me, that means that um, uh, we, we, if, we, if it is on the, our forehead, means we understand it. Right. And when it's on our hand, it's what we do. We right. implement it in our life because it goes hand to hand. We cannot just understand what is right. But if we don't do it and don't show to others how we live, it's, it's pointless. Okay. So we have to have that mark on the both places. Okay. I love that. Again, I, and I'm going to tie that in in a second, Boriana. Folks, look at this. You have a mark. And this mark is either on your forehead or it's, it's um, um, you know, and, and, and it's, or it's actually in their mouth. But, but look at it. It is a mark on their hand or it's a mark on their forehead. And it's the same language in Exodus 13 that we find in Revelation 13. Again, if you want to understand what the Bible is talking about, if you want to unlock Revelation, 
The key to it is found in the Old Testament. It's using the exact same language as Exodus 13. So let me bring this together for you. Here's what you need to know about the mark in your hand and your forehead and where this reference actually comes from, because the Jews actually had a reference um, for this language, and it comes from Egypt. And when the children of Israel were slaves in Egypt, now folks, this is where it all comes from, the Egyptians the Israelites saw that every Egyptian family, every Egyptian home had a household God. Everybody had a household God. Could be Ra, could be Set, could, could be um, cats, frogs, or hippos, or whatever. But every family had one God or two in particular that they worshipped. This was our family God. And you could tell which family worshipped which god because they had these plates or these frontlets that they put on their foreheads or on their right hand and it was a symbol of their god and you could look at that plate or frontlet or whatever it was and by that symbol you could tell who this who the household god was for that individual this is where this language comes from. And later on, the Egyptians, well, instead of having plates and things you know, tied around their head or you know, wrapped around their wrist, they would later uh, tattoo the symbol of their household god on their forehead and on their hand. And that mark told the world who your god is. Do you see where the language comes from? The Jews had an actual reference um, that they were familiar with uh, in terms of a mark on the forehead or the hand. And notice what God is telling the children of Israel. And you can go back, read this in, in Exodus chapter 13, 12, 13. And God is saying, when you keep the Passover, the way, when and how I tell you to keep the Passover, your celebration of the Passover, your obedience to what directions I am giving you, will tell the world like a mark on your forehead or on your hand that how and when you celebrate Passover is a mark that tells the world, I am the God who saved you. Do you see the connection between obedience to following what God tells us to do when and how he tells us to do it? Do you see the connection? God is saying, when you obey me and you do what I tell you, when and how I tell you, that is a mark that tells the world or a sign or a seal that tells the world, I am your God. And we get it from Exodus chapter 13 and the Passover. That's the language. This is where it comes from. But now God uses this same language of obedience and obeying and doing what he tells us to do when and how he tells us to do it not only does he apply that thought to the passover but he also applies it to his law could somebody read for us this next passage it's deuteronomy chapter six seven and eight could somebody please read this You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. Thank you, Anna. And again, this is in reference to the law of God. And, and notice what he says. Look, look at the language again. You shall bind them as a sign, this obedience to God's law, doing and his commandments, doing what God tells us to do when and how he tells us to do it, right? That's commandment keeping. You do what God tells you to do when and how he tells you to do it. And he says, when you obey me, when you make this a part of your very being, right? Now understand, God's law is a replication, a reflection of God's character of love. And God says, when you live out my laws of love, it is like a sign, again, on your forehead and on your hand. That's, so going back to what Boreana said, 
The law of God is in my heart. It's in my mind. And so I dwell on it. I think it. it's a part of my character. And I live it out in my life. Now, within the commandments, there is this idea of worship. And there's this one commandment that tells us how and when to worship. And the command coming up in the next chapter, in Revelation chapter 14, is a call to worship. It's Revelation chapter 14, 7. Can somebody please read this for us? Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all the springs of water. Now, folks, what's this last, what, what, it's the first angel of Revelation, and we have a call to do what? Worship. To worship. And, and, and notice it is the call to worship the God of creation, right? It very specifically identifies who this God is. We worship the God who created. Now, and he made the heavens, he made the sea, the earth, and, and the springs of water. And, and we, we, so we have this call to worship God. Now, here's the thing. God has actually given us a commandment that tells us how and when to worship. Uh, and you can read about, and, and God says, this is my day. Just make no mistake. This day that we are commanded to remember, to obey, uh, that, that calls us to worship the creator. And when we worship on this day, reminds us that we're worshiping the creator God. You cannot worship God on this day and not acknowledge that you're worshiping the God of creation. It's literally a mark and a sign that when you worship on the day commanded to, we are commanded to worship, it is like a sign telling the world that our God is the God of creation. And um, the Bible actually identifies for us which day this is. It's Isaiah. It's 58 and 13. Could somebody read this for us, please? Because of the Sabbath, you turned your foot from doing your own pleasure on my holy day. Now, let me ask you, what does God say or identify as his holy day? The Sabbath. It's the Sabbath. The Sabbath belongs to God because he created it. Now, look at what God says about the relationship between him and his people when we keep the Sabbath. And again, it's Exodus, it's 31 and 17. Could somebody please read this for us? Keep the Sabbath is a sign between me and the sons of Israel forever. For in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth, but on the seventh day, he ceased from labor and was refreshed. Okay. Now, folks, this is what scripture is telling us, that a relationship where you love God and keep his commandments is the greatest sign of worship and allegiance. Now, notice the language God is using. And, and scripture uses this language interchangeably, sign, mark, or seal. In other words, this is an indication of who your God is. When and how you worship is central to this idea of God's end time people who have the name of God and the seal of God, this sign, they are God's people, this mark, they are God's people, and, and this Sabbath seal, this obedience to the commandments of God is the opposite of what the mark of the beast is, which is also a, so the mark of the beast, if it is the opposite of the sign, seal, and mark of God, then it too must be um, related to this idea of how and when you worship as a sign of allegiance to the beast power. And we're going to see that in a moment. Now, God says this is like a sign, this sign, this Sabbath obedience and worship, this worshiping him on his holy day. He says it's like a seal that is placed on his end time people. Now, folks, an official seal 
consists of three elements. There are three things you will find on every seal um, that will uh, tell you that this is a seal who it belongs to. Can you think of three things that you would find on a seal that would tell you who this seal belongs to and, and what gives this seal authority? There are three things you'll find on every seal. Let me give you an example. If King James the first or second, I should say, had a seal and, and he put a seal on something and you were to read that seal, what are three things you might read on that seal that tells you this belongs to King James the second? It would surely have his name. That would be one. Okay, yes. Um, his position. Uh, pardon? His position. His position. Okay, so yes, I'm seeing name, imprint, name, logo, um, position, and location. And folks, these are the three elements of an official seal. They will tell you the name um, of the individual. Um, and, and so in this case, we have, you know, uh, James II. His title is king and his territory is the British Empire. Now, we come to the Sabbath and the commandment, the Sabbath commandment itself. And you can read this in Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. And there are three elements in the commandment to keep the Sabbath, three elements that tell us why the Sabbath is a seal of God. And there are the three same elements. So when we look at the Sabbath and we look at the Sabbath commandment, um, whose name do we find um, uh, attached to the Sabbath? God the creator. God the creator. Um, so we have the name on, you know, when we look at the Sabbath commandment, we have God's name, the Lord. His title is creator and his territory, the universe. And all of that is wrapped up in the Sabbath. Folks, the Sabbath represents God's power to create the world and empower your life. Uh, anyone who keeps the Sabbath is demonstrating allegiance to the creator God as they accept his complete authority over their life. This is why God says that Keeping his commandments is like a sign or a seal that's in our foreheads or, or on our hands. I mean, in the new covenant, God says, I want to write my law in your minds and on your hearts. Again, because the law is a revelation of God's character of love and the law calls us to love. In what way does God's law call us to love? And you think of two ways in which the law, the Ten Commandments, call us to a life of love. They're called the two great commandments. Love God and to love others. Absolutely. Right? And so what God wants to write in our hearts and our minds is this call to love him with all of our heart, mind, and soul, and our neighbor as we love ourselves. This is, this is what God's end time people will have written on their foreheads and on their hands as they obey and keep the commandments of God, um, especially in the area of how and when we worship. Um, it, it, is, it is a mark. It is a seal and a sign that tells the world who our God is. And so at the end of time, God's end time people who keep the commandments will have his character of love reproduced in their life as they live out that love life through obedience to God's laws of love, especially and including the Sabbath command, which is a seal of God's authority over our life. And it's a mark that will tell the world, a sign and a seal that will tell the world who our God is.
and it will be reflected in our characters and in our lifestyle. Now, if worshiping God, when and how he tells us to worship, is a sign of who our God is, then we must assume that the mark of the beast has something to do with how and when people worship as well. So let's take a look at what the mark of the beast is. And by the way, when we talk about the mark of the beast and we talk about the beast, according to the Bible and what we've learned so far, what is the beast of Revelation? Who or what is the beast of Revelation? The Catholic Church. Yeah, it's Papal Rome. It's the Roman Catholic Church. And we discovered that not so long ago. According to Daniel 7, it's the beast with the, um, it's, it's a little horn power, sorry, in Daniel 7, little horn power. In Revelation chapter 13, it is um, called the beast, and it's the exact same power. Little horn power, the beast power of Revelation 13, it, they are both papal Rome, and we studied that. Now, let me ask you something. Does papal Rome have a history of telling people how and when to worship so much so that they were willing uh, and able to force people to worship how and when they told people to worship is this true of papal rome did they do this yeah. yes they have the dark ages yeah during the dark ages when papal rome was given complete civil authority over the Christian world and the Roman Empire of its day, they used its authority to tell people how and when to worship. And this, this authority to tell people how and when to worship became a mark, literally a mark of its authority over the Christian world. Look at this. These are some statements that uh, come from uh, papal Rome itself. Um, could somebody please read this for us? Could somebody be willing to read this? Protestants do not realize that by observing Sunday, they accept the authority of the spokesperson of the church, the Pope. Okay, did you catch that statement, folks? When Protestants keep Sunday, they recognize the authority of the Pope of Rome. In other words, keeping Sunday is a mark that says we or a sign that says we're under the authority of papal Rome. But now why is why why are they saying that? Well, could somebody read this next statement, please? It's a pretty powerful statement. Sunday. Sunday. Go, Go ahead. ahead. <laughs> Go ahead, Anna. Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible. And this transference of Sabbath observers is proof of that fact. Now, folks, did you catch the language? Do you see the actual word they use in the Catholic record? Sunday is a? Mark, mark of, authority. of our authority. Now, the Sabbath is a mark of whose authority? God's authority. God's authority. And so do you, do you see how the mark of the beast or the mark of papal Rome and its authority is how is when you worship? Right? You're actually worshiping when the church tells you when to worship. And, and, and papal Rome says, hey, listen, you Protestants, this is a mark that you are under our authority. Now, here's what you need to know. Um, and this came from Pope John Paul II. And he wrote a paper called Deus Domini, meaning the day of the Lord. And he was in this encyclical letter um, that they call it. He was talking about the Sabbath the, the uh, origins of the Sabbath and what Sabbath means today or, or the keeping of Sunday as the Sabbath today. And look at what he says. He says, papal Rome has always had a strong sense of its own authority. Well, what, what are seals about? Seals are about an indication of authority. 
And so you have the seal of God and his authority, which is marked by Sabbath observance. And now you have papal Rome saying, look, the sign or mark of our authority is, well, perhaps it's, hey, look at what he says, perhaps the boldest thing, the most revolutionary change papal Rome ever did was to change the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. The day of the Lord, Deus Domini, was chosen, not from any directions noted in scripture, but from the church's sense of its own power. Pope John Paul II. Do you see the connection between the mark of the beast and papal Rome's authority and its use of power? God does not use power and force to coerce us into worshiping him on the day that he calls us to worship him. Do you see this difference? You have love, free will, and choice that is given by God. And when you love God, and you love others, and you worship God on his holy day, that is a sign and a mark that God has authority over our life, that we are his people. In contrast to that, the mark of the beast and the characteristic of the, 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 you know, the beast, its character is about force. It's about the misuse of power. It's about coercing people to do what it tells people to do. And it literally robs people of the freedom to choose how and when to worship. And so the mark of the beast isn't just Sunday observance, but it's about placing ourselves under the authority of a power that uses and abuses power to tell us how and when to worship. And so if God's character is a character of love, and that character of love is reproduced in his people, then the opposite mark of the beast is a group of people who use force and power to make other people do what they want it to do. And so you have God's people who live a life of love, and then you have the world that lives a life of power and control and dominance over others. And that character will be seen in two groups of people, those who love God and those who love power and control. Does this make sense? And it is reflected in how and when you worship. So here's what we know. The church, and by the church we mean papal Rome, claims that the change of the Sabbath is a mark of her own authority because virtually every Christian church, Protestant church, keeps Sunday. The only basis for keeping Sunday is the authority of the Catholic church. There is no authority from scripture to keep Sunday. And the Catholic Church makes this claim that the only reason that Protestants keep Sunday is because they are submitting to the authority of the church and not scripture, which is why the Bible identifies God's end time people as a commandment keeping people. So folks, here are some things we know from scripture that there is no authorization for Sunday worship in the Bible. From cover to cover, you can check this out. There is no such um, authorization given. And the papal Rome will tell you, every single pope, uh, bishops, priests, they'll tell you that the only reason people keep Sunday is because the church made the change, not God. Um, so it was the church, the papal Rome, that changed the day of worship. And they did so under its own authority, and it claims that Sunday worship is the mark of its authority. Folks, that's pretty heavy stuff. The mark of God's authority is obedience to the commandments of God as reflected in how we love, who we love, and worshiping when and how God tells us to worship. So if you want God's name written on your forehead, live a life of love.
as we are called to in the Ten Commandments to love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and others as you love yourself and as you live this life of love. In loving obedience to God, God's name will be written on your forehead because God's character of love is going to be reproduced in your life. And folks, if you do not have the name of God written in your forehead, if his character of love is not reproduced in your life, you will not receive the seal of God. Because the character of God and the seal of God go hand in hand in the same way that the mark of the beast and the character and nature of the beast also go hand in hand. And what we're going to see, and, and yes, Eunice, and uh, I, I maybe Marcus is with you over there as well. One of the things, folks, we need to know is, is that symbolic of this desire to force one of the tools that papal rome is going to use and and this is a, a sign of a babylon this is i've been talking about in my sermons about the spirit of babylon babylon and and i put this out there early on the spirit of babylon will always use force to make you comply with what it wants you to do how and when it wants you to do it and so when anytime you see uh, measures being used to take away your freedoms, and as we get closer to the end of time, you are going to see an erosion of freedoms, an erosion of freedoms, and an erosion of freedoms. And this is what papal Rome does. This is what the beast power does, is it literally robs our freedoms. And in the end, it's going to use this idea of buying and selling is the ultimate force, the ultimate control of making you comply with the mark of the beast, the authority of the church, when it tells you how and when to worship. It's literally about controlling your behavior. And so the more freedoms, whenever you see a loss of freedom, understand God is not in that. That is the spirit of Babylon, that is the spirit of Satan, that is the spirit of the mark of the beast. Now, folks, speaking of, and I'm running out of time here, speaking of papal Rome, now understand it is, understand there is a difference between papal Rome, which is the political arm of the Roman Catholic Church and the Catholic Church itself. There is a difference and what you need to know and we need to be very careful you'll notice that throughout this series i've been using papal rome intentionally because papal rome is is literally the political arm of the roman catholic church and what we got to be careful of is that there are a lot of good roman catholic people out there um who by faith are living up to the light they've received. And I, I want us to be clear as we close out here tonight that there are many Christians who currently keep Sunday who love God and they will receive eternal life. Um, they do not have the mark of the beast. And folks, we need to be very clear about this. The enforcement of the mark of the beast, how and when you worship, these removal of our um, and this enforcement through the no buy, no sell, robbing us of our freedoms, maybe throwing us in jail or taking our life. That enforcement of the mark of the beast has it's in the future. It has not yet happened. But let me tell you something. We are moving closer and closer and closer towards it. And we are headed down that road. Watch for the erosion of your freedoms. But that time, that ultimate enforcement of the mark of the beast it's not quite here yet but things are setting up for it and at that time when we do get to the enforcement of the mark of the beast at that time the governments of the world will issue a law to enforce sunday keeping they will literally use the economy and the no buy no sell to restrict your freedoms and to control how you behave and they will selectively stop people from buying and selling. And they will attempt to starve God's people into submission. But right now, 
those who are keeping Sunday, right now, the enforcement of the mark of the beast is not in place. That's not there yet. And there are a lot of people who are worshiping God on Sunday. They are doing so in faith, not knowing what we know. And folks, these people, they are saved because of they are living to the light that they have received. So let's be very careful when we make a distinction between the Roman Catholic people and papal Rome. Okay, folks, before we get into um, our questions for tonight, um, I, I want to ask, are there any questions in regards to anything we talked about here tonight? I know it was a lot to take in, a lot to digest. Uh, Gislin, you have a question. Yes, hi. So if we look at... Uh... Revelation 7 verses uh, 4 and 5, it's mentioning that 144,000 will receive the, the seal of God. Mm -hmm. At verse 9, there will be a multitude that is not to be counted. So is only 144,000 to receive the seal, but there will be people who will be saved without the seal? Okay, so here, here's one of those things uh, uh, about Revelation um, and, and the 144,000. One of the questions we get asked is, is the 144,000 a literal um, number? And, and just, you, you, you brought up a very important point that when we get to the kingdom, you're going to have those who've been saved throughout Earth's history and then you're going to have a group who were God's end time people who went through a very specific time of trouble that the rest of the saved never went through. Do you follow what I'm saying? So you, you will literally have in the kingdom those who were, uh, went through the end of time, who went through the time of trouble, who stood against the mark of the beast, and they are a very specific group compared to everybody else who was saved. And so, yes, Scripture makes a distinction between um, the 144,000 and those who were saved. Now, understand, all of God's people who've ever obeyed God will have God's seal on them. Because God says, obedience to me is like a sign or a seal. And so everybody who has obeyed God in some way, shape, or form has been sealed. But the 144,000 or this end-time group of people are recognized in scripture as a very special group of people because of what they're going to endure and go through at the end of time. But we do get asked the question, is the 144,000 a literal group, a literal number? Understand, most Bible scholars within the Adventist church agree that this is a symbolic number. And one of the reasons why we believe it's symbolic is because John says, I heard as it were 144,000. He says, but then I turn and I look around and I see a multitude um, on the sea of glass that you can't even number. So he hears one thing, but his eyes witness another. And so, and, and so again, scripture recognizes that out of all the saved down through history, from Adam and Eve to the close of probation, that at the end there will be a very special group that are unique and distinguished from everybody else who is saved. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. You're mm -hmm. welcome. Great question, by the way. Very great question. Anybody else? Okay, if not, let's get into our true and false, folks. I know that we're going just a little over. I, I hope you're okay with that. Um, I, I know that the true and false is, you know, kind of fun for a lot of us. So let's just quickly go through them. Um, question one, true or false? And folks, you can come off of your microphones for this, off your mute. Um, the name of God written on our foreheads is his character of love reproduced in our lives. True or false? True. 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 Folks, we're good with that. Is this one true? Oh, of course it is. Um, a person's name 
represented the character, and God's character is a character of love. Now understand, his nature is righteousness, holiness, perfection. His character is love, kindness, and if you go to uh, to to Galatians and you you read about the fruit of the spirit, all of those are Christ's character. That's the character of God, and God's character, those fruits of the spirit especially love, will be reproduced in God's end-time people. Folks, mm-hmm. second one. Okay, here's number two. The mark of the beast is a computer chip implanted under the skin that will contain all of our personal information. Oh. <laughs> Placide is laughing. Placide, why are you laughing? <laughs> There's no chips in heaven. <laughs> Now, folks, oh, that's funny. Now, now, here's what you need to know. Yes, folks, absolutely, this is false. Understand, they may come up with a computer chip that might be under our skin or could be on our cell phones, and it might contain all of our personal information. That technology is most likely coming. That is, however, not the mark of the beast. Okay, so yes, that's false. And with Placide, I'm, I'm laughing with you and everybody else. Folks, um, again, the mark of the beast is a system of false worship that tells us how and when to worship. And folks, in disobedience to God. Okay, so true or false? <laughs> I'm laughing at this one already. The beast with the lamb-like horns is Canada. Represented by the Canadian bison. <laughs> I know you're laughing, but I've heard people try and make this case. Um, but understand, um, folks, it is the United States of America which will force the world to worship the beast and its image. Um, again, one of the reasons why um, Canada is not the beast power of revelation is because this beast is without um, crowns on its horns and Canada has a crown over it. We are again, a, you know, the dominion of Canada under the, um, you know, the, the rule and the authority in part of the queen of England. So that rules out. <laughs> yes. You want to say, understand why you're asking the question, all those question marks. Okay, next. The seal of God is the sixth day of the week, the Sabbath. That's Um, Friday, right? The Sabbath, but the seventh day. Okay. So, folks, is it the sixth day of the week? The The seventh day. It is the seventh day of the week. It's false. The Sabbath is the seventh day of the week, and that is the seal of God. It is a sign that we worship the God of creation. Okay. The, most, the Muslim will be okay with the question. They will be, it's true. Yeah. Because they're, they're worshiping on Friday. Yes, they do. And, and, you know, it's kind of a little bit of a tricky question um, because when does the Sabbath actually begin for us Adventists? On Friday night. night. Friday night. So just a little bit of a trick question kind of s- slid in there. But yes, Placide, our Muslim friends would agree with that. Um, folks, um um okay going okay let me just uh go back here um next one true or false there are currently right now there are people who are following jesus based only on on okay there are currently many people who worship on sunday who love god and will receive eternal life we hope so and folks that's true true. Right now, there are people following Jesus based on the only light and truth they currently have, and they will be in the kingdom, which is why we do our best to not condemn or criticize other people who worship on a day differently than we do right now, because this is the only light they have. The folks understand a day is coming when the world will be divided into two camps and everybody will receive the light on the Sabbath as compared to Sunday. But that time has not yet come. That light has not fully come to, uh, to a head. It's coming, but it hasn't yet happened. Folks, I just wanted to ask a couple of quick questions. 
does keeping the Sabbath guarantee you will avoid the mark of the beast? Why or why not? What do you think? No, it's full of obedience to God. Okay. And it says no. Um, okay. Anybody else? Thanks. People who are saved worship the Sabbath. Well, but it's not the Sabbath that make you saved. So it's like the other way around. Oh, okay. <laughs> so Gislin is saying um, the, the Sabbath doesn't save you, but the saved keep the Sabbath. Is that what I'm hearing, Gislin? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, and, and Eunice is saying your heart needs to be in it. Anybody else? Does keeping the Sabbath guarantee you will avoid the mark of the beast? You might be keeping the Sabbath and not uh, having the seal of God in your forehead. Because if ah. you're not a loving Sabbath keeper, what, what's the point? Absolutely. All of this is true. Um, think about this. Did the Pharisees keep the Sabbath? Of course they did. And did they nail Jesus to a cross? Uh, of course they did. <laughs> Why? Because they did not have the love of God, of God in, their, in heart. their hearts. Okay. Jesus said, look, you keep the commandments, but you have missed the weightier, the heaviest part, most important part of the law. And that is how you love and how you treat other people. That's so, right. folks, if God and, and, and so if God's character is not reproduced in your life, keep the Sabbath all you want. <laughs> but without a life of love, you're not getting into the kingdom. So but now understand that if you love God, the keeping of the Sabbath will will protect you against the mark of the beast, but only in relation to your love for God. Mm -hmm. Make sense? I agree. Okay. So what is the key to obeying God from your heart instead of just outward actions? Love. Love. Okay. Anybody else? Folks, and I got it in one. It's love. If you do not love God, you actually cannot obey God. Now, you might keep the commandments, and you might be doing so out of fear. You might be doing it out of trying to win your salvation or keep your salvation, or maybe you're trying to prove to God you're worth saving. But understand, none of that saves you. Yes, it is relationship. It is a relationship with God that creates in us a love relationship. And out of love, only out of love, can you truly give obedience to God? So you can keep the Sabbath and you can keep the commandments, but if you do not love God and you do not love others, folks, you are not saved. So the key to obedience, the key to obeying the laws of love is to live a life of love. That's, that's the secret to, to, to obeying the commandments. And basically, folks, how can you prepare today to avoid receiving the mark of the beast? Surrender. Surrender. Daily. Daily. Anybody else? I like that. Surrender. And I like that thought, Eunice. When you know him, you will love him. And folks, the best way to prepare to avoiding the mark of the beast is a daily, intimate, personal relationship with Jesus Christ where you surrender your heart to him on a daily basis. A few things I want you to remember. God has a true day of worship. God will never force you to love him or obey him. And God longs to have an intimate relationship with you. And so folks, Knowing that God wants to reproduce his character of love in you, are you willing to let him? And that was our study for tonight. Now, I know we went over a little, uh, over time a little. Uh, my apologies for that. I hope that you can pray you were blessed in this study. This is a big study, um, and, and it needed a little bit more careful time. Uh, and I hope that at the end of this, you understand the nature uh, and the issues at play and at stake when it comes to the mark of the beast. I hope you were blessed by that. Um,
Glenna, it's good to see you. Um, folks, tonight, before we close out, um, do we, ha as always, do we have any prayer requests um, that we would like to, prayers, praises, uh, folks, anything on your heart that you'd like to pray about tonight? I know that we've been praying for Galena. Uh, Placide, how's your mom doing? Uh, she she is doing better. She is stable. She's still at the hospital, and uh, they've been able to drain the water from her body. Mm. She still has some liquid on the right side of her heart. Mm -hmm. But because she is also diabetic, the, uh, the medication she's taking is affecting her kidney. Mm. So it's a catch-22 issue, but she's, she's doing okay on it. Let's put it that way. And okay. I'm, I'm so happy because uh, the week that I asked for prayer, I wa for me, from what I was seeing, I thought the end was, was there. Wow. And so it's, it's, it's a miracle that she's still, she's a fighter. She fought two cancer, breast cancer. Mm -hmm. She had four knee surgeries. So yeah, she, her, her preferred verse, it's uh, Psalms 118 verse 17. Okay. okay. I will not die and I will give praise to the Lord daily. Thank you for asking and thank you, thank you for praying for her. And uh, I just want to give thanks to the Lord because having her today, it's, it's a miracle from, from my point of view. Amen. Amen. Um, folks, we also want to uh, thank you, Placide. Um, we want to also pray for you, Mila. Um, I've also um, have uh, Eunice to sing, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right, uh, Eunice. Uh, or Marcus uh, Kilza, uh, their friend, uh, and people who've lost loved ones, uh, and in particular their friend uh, Kilza. Uh, and, and Lana sang for a friend in Newfoundland, um, uh, their wedding photographer. Oh my goodness, and, and Lana, you've been celebrating your anniversary recently, I believe. And, and their wife, his, the wedding photographer's wife passed away suddenly two nights ago. Uh, she had Parkinson's. Um, um, then they were lovely people, lovely Jehovah's Witness couple. And, uh, um, folks, again, it's, it's so hard when we lose loved ones and friends and people we know. And so we want to, um, uh, for Lana's friends and, uh, uh, and again, folks, uh, for Kilza and of course, you know, the States is just, there's so much violence in the States right now. Um, and around the world. And folks, again, we want to remember the situation in Ukraine. Uh, and again, please continue to pray for our church. And I'm going to ask you to remember my brother in prayer. Uh, my brother is, um, he, he's a schizophrenic and um, refuses to get help. And I'm praying that, that God would move on his heart to get the help that he so desperately needs. It's literally um, affecting every area of his life and um, it's 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 becoming worse um, and and the behaviors it creates are becoming worse so please remember my brother um, in prayer as well and again um, I'm praising God for what he's doing at Nepean um, in a couple of weeks we'll be able to release some really great news and um, I'm just praising God for all of his love Folks, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer as we close out tonight. And uh, let's bow our heads. Uh, Father God in heaven, Lord, we love you. And we are so glad that, Lord, you love us, that you invite us into loving, intimate, personal relationships with you. Uh, we're so thankful that, God, you've given us your law of love. And we pray that, Lord, it would be in our hearts, in our minds, and in our mouth, this love for you that we can express in our love for others. And Lord, we pray that as we get closer to the end of time, that you would indeed 
reproduce your character of love and your nature of holiness and righteousness in all of us. And Lord, in order for that to happen, we need a savior. And we're so thankful that we have Jesus um, who took our sins to the cross. And, and Lord Jesus, we put our belief and our faith in the fact that your cross removes and forgives our sin and that in you and you alone we find salvation and we thank you for the forgiveness of our sin we pray for the forgiveness of our sin and that lord you would remove it and renew within all of us this clean heart a heart after you and because we know you love us lord we know we can come to you with our praises, Lord. We have wonderful things going on in our life. We know that you've answered prayers. Um, you're growing your church. You're reproducing your character in your people. And Lord, we see things coming together that's telling us that your coming is sooner than ever before. And added to the, our praises are our requests. We keep in mind Placide and his mom and what you've been doing in her life. We continue to pray and, and plead for uh, Galena, who has stage four cancer. And Lord, we are praying that you would redeem her body from this disease and that you would bring healing into her life. And that, Lord, you would speak your word against the cancer and restore her to health. And we pray the same for Galena and others that we have brought before you. Lord, we pray for uh, people like my brother who struggle with mental illness, um, who are in need of help. And Lord, I'm praying that you would bring somebody alongside my brother and people like my brother and who can bring them to the resources and the help they need um, to restore their mental health and to give them a life that, Lord, is functional and, and uh, a blessing to them. We pray, Lord, that in this world, you would ease the pain and suffering. Lord, again, we heard of another shooting down in the States. There's war in the Ukraine. There's war around the world. And uh, this is a violent, fallen world. And we pray, Lord, that you would bring comfort to those who've lost loved ones. Um, Marcus and Eunice uh, bring forward their friend. Uh, I, I hope I'm pronouncing the name right. Kilza. Uh, uh, Lord, again, we pray that you would come alongside those who are suffering and hurting and that you would bring your comfort, your love, and your strength into their life. Lord, we continue to pray for the Nepean church family and uh, the churches in and around the Ottawa area and our sister church, you know, Carlton Place. Lord, we pray that you would, again, raise up your churches to be a beacon of light, a ray of hope, a place of healing in this world, and that, God, you would, through us and our love for you, may your May your word become a light in the darkness of the world around us. Lord, we love you. We pray that you would come soon. And may your seal ever be upon us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And folks, that is our Bible study for tonight. Again, for those of you who are uh, with us on Facebook Live, thank you for joining us and for your comments. There are so many comments out there tonight. And for those of you with me on Zoom, again, appreciate your participation and um, being with me tonight. And for those later on in the week on YouTube, again, thanks for being a part of our family and a part of this study. Everybody, have a good night. God bless. I hope to see you next week. And uh, of course, I uh, want to invite you to join us on Sabbath for worship as well. Take care. God bless. We'll see you next week. God, God bless you as well. Good evening. Bye. Bye-bye.